small change can make a big change. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12487 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12487. Moved. Thank you, Minister. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12487, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to the next item of business, which is topical questions. Question 1, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to suspend the use of transvaginal mesh implants since the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing called for this on 17 June 2014. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. I recently met with women who have experienced complications and have asked that the Acting Chief Medical Officer writes again to health boards this week requesting that they consider suspending these procedures until the independent review has reported. The CMO originally wrote to health boards in June 2014 requesting this following the former Cabinet Secretary's decision regarding these procedures. In requesting this, I recognise that a small number of women, having discussed options with their clinician, will still want to proceed. This may be because they are experiencing extremely difficult symptoms. In those instances, the women concerned must fully consent, be completely aware of the risks and having uh, considered alternatives. I've also requested that health boards follow a protocol to provide assurance that this process is being followed in every case and will be working with women concerned to develop an outline protocol. Jenny Marla. I think it's fair to say, Presiding Officer, that there is extreme confusion as to what the Scottish Government's position is over this, because women left Parliament last June, understanding that the then Health Secretary found these operations to be completely un unacceptable and understood that no more would happen. We found that since then, 166 operations have taken place. This weekend, Shona Robison seems to have guaranteed Scottish women that they won't now take place. Can she tell the Chamber, will any more mesh operations operations take place in Scotland and his, is her guarantee any firmer than the one given last June by her predecessor? Um, there is no confusion other than perhaps in the mind of Jenny Mara and let me explain why that is. Since the 17th of June until the end of September last year, health boards carried out 76 mesh implant procedures for stress, urinary incontinence, while the numbers for pelvic or organ prolapse are too small to report due to the risk of disclosure. Prior to that request to suspend, uh, health, health boards were carrying out around 1,500 mesh implant procedures annually for stress urinary incontinence and 350 procedures for prolapse. So there has been a dr dramatic reduction in those number of procedures. Well, as I explained in my first answer, where women who ask for this procedure to be carried out in consultation with their clinician, aware of all of the risks and have it, have, having explained to them what the alternatives are, decide in that full knowledge that they want to proceed, then there is nothing we can do to stop that. And it's very important that the women I met with understood that fully. In fact, that's why they took part in drafting the patient information leaflet, so that the women concerned would have that full information to be able to make an informed decision. The women I met with fully understood that. And that's why, of course, we're going to make sure that the protocol is followed, because I want to make sure in every case it is informed consent. And that is why, in agreement with the women I met with, they wanted to make sure that there was a protocol and wanted to be involved in the development of that protocol. And further, and finally on this, the regulation of medical devices, including implants, is reserved to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. That is the body 
responsible for regulating all medical devices in the UK. They have not banned mesh implants. In fact, they have said uh, that the implants, uh, there is no evidence that these implants are unsafe. So they are not a banned product. And because of that, while we can ask health boards to suspend, and that would be my preference, where a woman explicitly asks for this procedure in consultation with her clinician, in full awareness of all the risks, with informed consent, then that is what should happen. And the women I met with fully understood that. Ms. Murray? No, um, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given the growing number of compensation claims in America, Sorry. Uh, given the growing number of compensation claims in America, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about potential compensation claims in Scotland, especially in the light of several health boards having ignored Cabinet Secretary Alec Neill's advice to stop such operations, 166 of which have taken place since that advice was given? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to... Uh, pass judgment on compensation claims. That is obviously a, a legal matter. John Scott will be aware that the independent review is looking at all of the evidence, is looking at the, the work that the EU has carried out and will be reporting in May. Uh, our suggestion to boards is that the s suspension of procedures uh, should uh, be in place until that report comes in May. But as I explained in my answer to Jenny Mara, where a woman wants to go ahead with that procedure, which is a procedure that is not banned, and the MHRA is the regulatory body overseeing these procedures and have said in their uh, view that there's no evidence these implants are unsafe, then uh, with that explicit um, consent and informed consent and aware of all the risks, then really there is nothing that a, a clinician can do uh, to say no uh, to, to that woman as long as she is absolutely clear. And that's why the protocol uh, that we are developing at the moment is to make sure that that conversation is absolutely clear about alternatives, about risks, and it is fully informed consent. And in May, when we get the independent review, obviously uh, I will be um, happy to come back to Parliament and inform members of what that review says and the action that we would take uh, from then on in. Neil Findlay. Last week, the pe Petitions Committee heard that several multi-million pound payouts have been made in the US whilst MESH is still being used. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the risk to NHS finances of similar action being taken here? How many cases have been lodged in the courts? And will she publish in SPICE the Scottish Government's risk assessment of both the procedure itself and the financial implication for the Scottish Health Service? And finally, if everyone understood the policy in June, why is she re-announcing the same policy in March? Cabinet well, as I said to John Scott, um, I'm not going to comment on compensation claims. That is for a, a matter uh, out with this chamber. But can I be clear, as I've said to Jenny Mara and John Scott, the MHRA, which regulates medical devices, has not banned this product. So it is a product that is available. And therefore, I've explained in quite a lot of detail today under what circumstances in terms of clinical judgment. Uh, if the member would allow me to finish without interruption, that would be helpful. That the, the very clear procedures for agreement of informed consent to that procedure. And Neil Finlay should be aware that women have actually been writing to us saying that they have benefited from this procedure. Now, the reason that we have asked for the suspension is in the light of the independent review. We believe that we need to look at all of the evidence and come to some conclusions. That will be happening in May. The reason I wrote, uh, or the Chief Medical Officer wrote again to boards, was to remind them of our position that we think it would be better for boards to suspend those procedures. But we recognise that the individual women will have the right to ask for that procedure to take place. And as long as there is informed consent, knowing all the risks, with the protocol that I've described, then that is the way that we will proceed. Jackson Carlo. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Dr Maguire of the MHRA last week giving evidence to Parliament expressly declined to support her call for a moratorium? 
In support, he cited a report in October 2012, which turned out to be a short review conducted by three people and led by a librarian in 2012, two years earlier. Um, does she agree that she has the unequivocal support of us all in this chamber in that the, cautionary take, the precautionary line which she has adopted, which is to call for a moratorium on these uh, operations, is evidenced by the many women in Scotland who have experienced dreadful difficulties and injuries as a result, and that, frankly, the MHRA's reliance upon a two-year-old study, which was nothing more than a literary review, is quite disgraceful. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to Jackson Carlaw, I am aware of the evidence that the MHRA gave uh, to committee. Uh, clearly, uh, we are not in control of the MHRA in terms of uh, their reporting. They report to the UK government. They have the power over um, the regulation of medical devices. We do not have direct powers to remove mesh products from use in NHS Scotland. And the MHRA have their position on this, which at the moment is that there's no evidence those implants are unsafe. However, as you will be aware, there is a lot of other research going on. The EU is looking at this matter in detail. An independent review that at, we have commissioned and which will report in May will look at all of that and will help to guide where we go uh, from there. And as I've said to other members, I'm more than happy to come back to this chamber in whatever uh, format would uh, be most appropriate to discuss that matter, the matter further uh, um, at that point. And I want to just put on record my thanks to the women involved who have done a tremendous amount of work on the patient information leaflet. They are working with us on the new helpline that NHS 24 will provide and are working with us on the protocol. And I want to put on record my sincere thanks for them in the very difficult circumstances that they find themselves in. Question number two, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what concerns it has regarding reports that an anti-Muslim demonstration is to be called by an organisation describing itself as Pegida Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, Police Scotland's monitoring of social media has revealed that Pegida intend to hold a static demonstration in Edinburgh on the evening of Saturday the 21st of March. Police Scotland are taking this event very seriously and closely monitoring developments. Public safety is paramount and those who seek to demonstrate must behave in a lawful manner or face prosecution. I spoke with Chief Superintendent Mark Williams, Police Commander for Edinburgh, earlier today and he has provided assurances that all steps are being taken to ensure that no issues arise out of Pekida's proposed demonstration. Uh, Police Scotland have powers available to them under the Public Order Act 1986 to ensure public safety is protected and order is maintained. Those who seek to incite violence will be dealt with firmly and reported to the Crown. The Scottish Government fully supports Police Scotland in taking all appropriate and proportionate action required. Prime Officer, I speak for all of my colleagues in the Scottish Government and I am sure all members of this chamber when I say that we do not tolerate Islamophobia or any other form of hatred or hate crime. We will not tolerate extremists who peddle hatred under the guise of protecting society. Patrick Harvey. I am grateful to the Minister for his answer, and particularly the last part of it, which properly addresses the threat that these kind of organisations pose across Europe. We have seen some governments in Europe make the mistake of aping or giving ground to the hard right and racist xenophobic movements. That is a, a strategy which is doomed to fail. Others have given clear leadership and said that this movement is not welcome uh, in our countries. And I, I hope that the Scottish Government will continue to do that. Given that this organisation ex expresses as part of its aim to rid these islands of Islam, isn't it clear that this is a movement which poses explicit threat to Muslim citizens in this country? And any organisation uh, of this nature clearly raises public, health, public safety uh, concerns, which must be addressed and taken very seriously. Cabinet Secretary. Also, the member raises a very important point, uh, because uh, uh, the Muslim faith is an integral part of Scottish society, and it's part of the rich, multi-interfaith uh, relationships we have within Scotland, and is an important part of 
uh, Scottish society and any organisation that seeks to unpick that or to try and exploit it should not be tolerated in any shape or fashion and it certainly will not be tolerated by the Scottish Government. Pekida and the uh, message that they seek to peddle, the message of hatred that they seek to peddle, should not be tolerated in any shape or fashion. And I can give the Member and the Chamber an assurance that Police Scotland will deal with this issue in a robust and proportionate way, but also as a Government. We are a Government that believes in a tolerant society and that the faith of Islam has an important part to play within Scottish society. And alongside the important work that will be taken forward by Police Scotland in dealing with this particular issue will also be to offer reassurance to those members of the Muslim faith within Scotland and in particular within Edinburgh as well prior to and after this particular demonstration. And I can also give the member in the chamber an assurance that Police Scotland and the Scottish Government will provide the local community, the local Muslim community and the Muslim community in Scotland with all the necessary reassurance that they require. Patrick Harvey. I thank the Minister again for that answer. Um, does he agree that many Muslims in this country and in, in many European countries not only feel under threat and marginalisation from these aggressive, hostile movements against them, but also from an expectation that it's for them to continually apologise for acts of extremism that they have never uh, sought to condone or support. Uh, does he agree that it's uh, something the Scottish Government must work across departments, including with the Department of Education, to ensure that all young people growing up in Scotland uh, are given a sense of an inclusive Scotland and one in which those values of tolerance and respect are important? It's not just about responding to the movement of hatred, but building a, a, an inclusive uh, a sense of, of the kind of Scotland we wish to build in the future. Cabinet Secretary. Also, not only should we be robust in how we tackle issues of hatred within our society, uh, Patrick Harvey is also right. It's also about uh, promoting community cohesion and partnership. And that's an important element of the work which the Scottish Government takes forward within the Justice Directorate and also with my uh, colleague Alec Neil in helping to work in support with those uh, within our faith groups in uh, Scotland. And some of the meetings I've already had with individuals within uh, the Muslim community is about providing that reassurance that the whole issue is not about Muslims having to apologise for the appalling behaviour and acts of barbarity by certain individuals and organisations who conduct these under the guise of being Islam eh, or being Muslims. It is about Muslims in this country being seen as being a valued member of our society and that they should not feel themselves in any way having to apologise for the appalling acts of other people in other parts of the world or even should it ever come to our own shores. And the work that both myself and my colleague Alec Neil will be taking forward is to continue to offer that reassurance. I should also add that I do think that our media also have an important part to play in getting that message across, not expecting Muslims in Scotland to apologise for the actions, the barbaric actions of those in other parts of the world. That's certainly the message I've taken out to the Muslim community, and it's a message which this government will continue to take out to the Muslim community as well. Malcolm Chisholm. Does the Cabinet Secretary think it would be entirely appropriate for the City of Edinburgh Council to use whatever powers it has to prevent this demonstration taking place, given that the whole purpose uh, of it is to uh, foster Islamophobia and to stir up hatred against thousands uh, of Muslims who live in Scotland and who contribute so much to Scottish life? Cabinet Secretary. Um, we've already been in contact with the Edinburgh City Council on this matter, and they've had no contact from Pekida. Uh, the reason being is because um, uh, it would appear that they are not intending to have a march as such for which they would require uh, permission from uh, the Council. But what I can assure the Member of is that both Police Scotland, Edinburgh City Council and the Scottish Government will take forward the measures that we consider to be appropriate. It's still an early stage in terms of having the full details of this, but from the discussion I had uh, with the Chief Superintendent today, you can be assured that both Police Scotland and Edinburgh City Council are taking this matter very seriously and will take forward measures as they see appropriate when they get further information on the nature and the potential scale of this demonstration. Jimmy McGregor. Thank you. Um, does the Minister agree with me that in the light of recent events of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, that it is essential that we safeguard the freedom of speech 
and join me in commending the UK government's work to ensure that all of us, regardless of religious or racial background, feel safe and respected in our country. Well, I should say to the member that I do recognise that freedom of speech is a, a, a fundamental uh, human right, and we all have a, a duty to protect it, uh, to respect it, and to uphold that. However, I should also add uh, that it's not an absolute right, and it mustn't be exercised in such a way uh, in regard to uh, that it has an impact on the rights of others. And that's why there's a, a clear difference between that of uh, legitimate public protest uh, and gatherings uh, that also from that of gatherings which intend to stoke up racial hatred and to cause fear and alarm within our communities. There is a difference, and that difference should be appropriately recognised. Jill Mason. Uh, can I associate myself with all that the Cabinet Secretary has said? I mean, on the point of freedom of speech, how do we get the right balance, does he think, between allowing freedom of speech and yet preventing hate speech from groups like this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is no uh, straightforward way in which to uh, do that, as a member will properly uh, recognise. But although in upholding that human right of uh, the freedom uh, of speech and expression, it's not an absolute right that you can have disregard to the offence uh, and the injury that you may cause to another, particularly those, as I've mentioned, who might wish to incite uh, racial hatred and racial uh, violence and to create fear and alarm within um, our uh, communities. And we have to make sure that we are alive uh, to these issues uh, and to respond to them at the appropriate time. And what the member in this chamber can be assured of is a government where we do believe uh, actions have been taken which are about promoting racism uh, and about causing fear and alarm within our communities, that appropriate measures will be taken both by our law enforcement agencies and also by our other partners who work to promote community cohesion within our communities and to make sure that communities do not feel and individuals do not feel alienated as a result of these types of events. Question number three, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the findings of the research commissioned by the Welfare Reform Committee, which suggests that parents and disabled people are being hit hardest by the UK Government's welfare reforms. Minister Margaret Burgess. This report highlights the scale of the damage inflicted by the UK Government's cuts and changes and adds to the growing evidence base around the negative impacts of welfare reform on Scottish households. Those changes are placing parents and disabled people under intolerable strain as they struggle to cope with the changes being introduced. The Scottish Government is doing all that it can to help those affected and we are investing around £296 million across 2013-14 to 2015-16 to limit the damage of the reforms. While we can't fully mitigate all the effects of welfare changes within the powers and resources we have, we will continue to make the argument for a fairer welfare system. Claire Adams. Thank the Minister for her answer. The port does give further evidence that some of the most vulnerable members of society are losing out. And all of this before we include the impact of harsher sanctions regimes, which we already know is in increasing the impact on the incomes of, of lone parents and disabled people. Does the Minister agree with me that given the scale of income lost through the benefit cuts, the UK Government must urgently investigate claims of DWP's imposed pressure on staff to apply benefit sanctions, sanctions that are quite clearly impacting on the incomes of the most vulnerable in Scotland? Minister. I, mean, I certainly would agree with the member. I think we're in a situation where we have a government in the UK that is so far removed from the reality of what's going on uh, within communities uh, throughout the country. We have a government who will not accept the evidence that's been put in front of them regarding sanctions and food banks. We've got organisation or after organisation lining up to produce the evidence for the government, for the UK government who, who refuses absolutely to accept it. We've even seen the churches intervening to say that some of the um, sanction regime in particular and the targets set for it are inhumane, yet the UK government still ploughs on. I would want to say that this government is totally opposed to that and accepts that austerity it does not reduce inequality. Ms. Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, cabinet, the Minister may be aware of a recent article in the Scotsman, Poverty is a Child Protection Issue, written by Harry Stevenson, who is President of the Social Work Scotland, in which he poses the questions, 
Can you imagine the despair of parents who are fully aware of being unable to meet the basic needs of their children? Can you imagine the impact of an indignity of living in long-term poverty? And most importantly, can you imagine the impact of children's confidence and self-worth? Giving these comments, in addition to the growing evidence about welfare reform policies, what message does the Cabinet Secretary send to those UK parties who voted for continued austerity in the UK budget? Cabinet Minister. I could say very clearly, I would, I would say to him to think again, but clearly that's why the First Minister, um, our First Minister, argued last month we need to bring an end to the austerity agenda of the Tories and Labour and instead increase public investment uh, by £180 billion compared to the Tory plans in the UK over the next four years. It's only by aust ending austerity that we'll be able to bring an end to the need for food banks an end to the suffering that people are having through the benefit sanctions. This government wants to see the economy grow and reduce inequalities, and to do that, we have to end austerity. Alex Johnson. Would the Minister not agree with me that while we all understand that welfare reform is a long and hard but necessary road, that it's one that we must tread? And further, with regard to her comments regarding the use of sanctions, uh, is it not appropriate to acknowledge that in the previous cycle, sanctions peaked in 2007 under a Labour government, and that that peak, while it was exceeded in 2013 and early 2014, it now represents a peak, and that the use of sanctions has fallen off largely because of the will of those who claim benefits to abide by the rules and carry out the necessary requirements to seek work as part of the process. Minister. What I would say to the member is that um, I, I don't believe punishing people on benefit is the result, gets the results that we are looking for. We want to encourage people um, to, to, to take up work and comply if they're able to do so. The evidence, no, I, I would have to say that um, the, the member shouting across, it's working, it's working. The evidence we are getting from those in the front line and the stories that we are hearing and seeing in our constituencies, offices day and daily are telling me very clearly it's not working. Yeah, yeah. You, don't work, you don't force people to do something, which is what the UK government are trying to do. And we know when we've got churches saying that this is not right either, standing up for the people because they see it is not working. It is punitive. It is unfair. It is impacting in children, as Claire Adamson uh, indicated in her question. It's impacting in children and it's impacting in the most vulnerable. So, no, I don't agree with the member. Many thanks. That concludes topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2.